and uh, so on. But the Dongguya just said, Amara Dharma Pahar, our religion is the mountains. And this is one of the most radical statements you can ever imagine. In a way, it's a religion based on materialism <coughs> as well as the spirits of nature. So when they say Niam Raja is one of their supreme rajas and he lives at the top of the mountains and it would damage him to cut the, the trees, they are saying something that any environmentalist will, as it were, support them and say they are they have a very, very correct ecological understanding. Well, um, actually one of the reports that was uh, given at that time to try and support Vedanta was by an institute in, a mining institute in Ranchi and it contains the sentence something like this that actually bauxite mining doesn't damage the water regime it improves it because during the bauxite mining micro cracks develop in the side of the mountain and this improves the runoff of water from the mountain and it regenerates the groundwater this is the most ridiculous sentence or concepts you can have from a scientist because what it's saying is that when the monsoon rain falls it falls straight off the mountain and as a storehouse of water as an origin of many springs and streams that form the great rivers the mountain is dead and this is what the DFO understood but it's what very few scientists seem to understand or at least don't write about it because so much science is paid for science that it's, and in that sense, the economic system is influencing what is being published in as science. And you have, you can find this on YouTube where one of the Dongbia leaders called Lado Sikorka is saying, I'll say it in Oriya because um, it sounds better. I, I don't know Bengali, I know Oriya, so forgive me if you can understand it. Loko Kohichanti, Kete Kortia Tonka Rochi, Amaro Niangri Upre. Kintu Kortia Tanka Nahi, Amaro Mabab Tachi, our Ame Rokia Koribu. Meaning, people say, and you get this even in the textbooks, in Oriya school textbooks, Orissa is one of the poorest states of India. But it has, it's one of the richest in minerals. These minerals are lying unutilized, and all we have to do is utilize them and Orissa will become rich. It's again a massive, based on a massive misunderstanding. And if you understand the mining industry, like we, as it were, laid it bare in the book on the aluminium industry, you understand the fallacies in that. But tribal people, understand it in a much more holistic way because they understand the mountains are literally the sources of life because these perennial streams mean beneath these books at cap mountains there's immense fertility in the land and if you go to the one major mountain that is india's biggest bauxite mine which is nalco's damanjodi mines 14 kilometers from damanjodi on panchpat mali in kurapa district you find the land around the mountain is almost deserted and these perennial streams have died, dried up. So this is, these are the kind of ways where tribal people have an understanding of economics or of the economy that is based on respect for nature and really a very, very deep understanding for nature. And in many ways, my fears for this country, it's, which is also my fears for the whole world, but is, it focuses on the water systems above all. That if you understand what is an ecosystem, at the essence of an ecosystem is the natural systems of circulation of water. This is how our planet is different from the moon from other planets, that we have water, water is life. We know this, but what are we doing to our natural water systems? And if you look at, I've mentioned mountains, where the streams and rivers start, 
If you look at dams, 3,000 or more big dams are interrupting the flow of water. If you look at the metals factories, they are taking so much water and polluting so much that while we were writing the aluminium book, we went to Germany where the Wuppertal Institute of Studies Resource Use in most, maybe the most professional way of any institute in the world. And the, the figures it gives is that to produce one ton of steel consumes and pollutes over 40 tons of water. So India's steel output in the 1950s was about 1 million tons. Last year it was 6 to 9 million tons. Every one of those million tons is consuming 40 tons of water. That is what's happening to our water. And we might think we are overtaking the so-called developed countries and in raising the steel production, but actually the whole thing is being masterminded from London and Washington because it's much cheaper to get India to use its resources like this rather than go on producing steel there. For, for the financial institutions is essentially what I mean, and the corporations. And if it's 40 tonnes of water for steel, for aluminium it's over a thousand tonnes of water for every tonne of aluminium produced. So if the aluminium production is also going up and up, I mean in northwest Arista some of you may know that there are already virtual wars between the farmers and the metal factories over the Hiroko Dam and the water that the farmers were promised has not been given because the new aluminium smelters, Bush and steel plant and others are taking the water in huge quantities and those deals have been signed and even the chief minister can do nothing about that. And if then if you look at the underground water aquifers, the situation is probably even worse. And here in the Statistical Institute, I would ask you especially to look at statistics of groundwater. Because if we're going to talk about development, what we need to be working towards is working with the natural systems of water cycles and water replenishment. And we'd be working towards the ground level coming up. Instead, the statistics, which are quite hard to get, of water depletion are absolutely terrifying. That if you look at Punjab in particular, where I've looked at the statistics, they're mentioned in the book, I don't have them completely in my head, but roughly um, until the 1960s when the Green Revolution happened, and the, which was based on mining water, you had more than 90% of Punjab, you had water within 10 metres of the surface. Now you have to go down often two or three or four hundred metres to get water, and it's very often contaminated, obviously with fertilisers and pesticides, but also with um, fluoride and like here, also you have arsenic when you go down very deep. So, if you think of these statistically, 50, 60 years depletion of groundwater from 10 metres to 300 metres, what's the next 50 years going to bring? I mean, unless we are working towards replenishing and working with the natural systems of replenishment, we're pretty much done for. I mean, the country is very close in, in danger of becoming a desert in the very near future. Because, and this is not only India, it's also parts of America, it's also parts of China, it's also the Middle East. The levels of groundwater extraction and the damage to the underwater aquifers, it's like these underwater aquifers are deep unconscious, that is, really has supported us for ever since life began. And now by depleting them in this way for industrial style agriculture and for um, the, the metals industry and so on, we are de depleting the, um, the ground we stand on, literally, or the water that gives us life. So, in one, of, one of you asked about sustainable development, and 
the way the concept has been defined at the UN, it's often said, in a way, sustainable development is a concept that tries to link these concepts of economy, that's, which is often equated with development, and ecology, which is often equated with sustainability. But the trouble with that is these three pillars of sustainable development are often given as economy, society, and environment. But they're nearly all always given in the logically incorrect way. That if you put the economy first, which too often Marxists agree with the mainstream, it always economy has to come first. Why? Surely, economy, market, is something that should be serving people and society. Not, not that we are born, that we should be serving some kind of economic god called the market. And logically, environment has to come first. Otherwise, sustainability is a misuse of the word. I mean, in practice, when it's used economically, I've seen a sustainable development report of Vedanta where they claim they are teaching the tribal people sustainable development. It's a complete misuse of language that um, sustainability means planning for the next thousand years at least. I mean, the cons have been there since Ashoka was there. I mean, Ashoka was there over 2,000 years ago. The cons retreated to the more interior places, they have sustained there for over 2,000 years. How are we planning for the next 2,000 years? I would say the short, because of the emphasis on the financial short-term profit, there is no planning in place for the long term. And if you look at water in particular, this is very, very clear. There's so many other things I wanted to say, and thank you for listening so beautifully. Um, if you would like to ask questions for a few minutes, then I'm very happy to take some questions. And then I would love to um, play a, a short bit of music, partly because I think this holistic form of knowledge that is there in Alivasi societies that we will need if we are to survive it depends on the split between feeling and thinking it needs to be in some way healed. That the mind, if it's not linked to feeling and feeling what are the results of our actions, we're lost and we need to reclaim this. It's like a, a yoga of rejoining mind and body and rejoining thinking and feeling and so, very often, if you go to a music concert, it's lovely entertainment, but it's not seen as in any way linked with economics or politics. But I think economics has a huge... Uh, music has a huge role to play in, as it were, beginning to heal some of the wrong directions that human beings have taken in in the last few generations. Thank you. Questions? Uh, actually, I have listened to your lecture some three years back also <coughs> in this institute. And I agree uh, on the points that have been tribal societies, economy, and the way they have been treated. <laughs> but some, I disagree on some theoretical questions. Like, uh, I don't think that uh, Darwin's theory was mechanically applied to society by Marx and Engels. I think Marx and Engels tried. <coughs> I wanted to first establish that society is not a static thing, it is dynamic, and they wanted to find the most basic laws of uh, development of society, mm. and uh, the most general law is like uh, struggle between force of production and relation of production, 
this contradiction actually give uh, the motion to this society. So I think that uh, this Darwin's theory was not uh, uh, directly applied to society, at least by Karl Marx or Frederick Engels, but I don't know about this tension. The second point is that uh, Marxists actually don't vote economy first just because of some moral reasons, which is not moral question, it's a theoretical question. Actually, they think that economics, economics make the, uh, build the structure of this society based upon which superstructure actually develops. So in that sense, it is not a moral question. It is a, it is a theoretical question that what is the most basic things that determines the various features of a society. In that case, they think that economy is the basic foundation upon which other superstructure comes. And, and, uh, and also, you see, uh, because uh, many times actually you mentioned about uh, this Marxist of Marxist question, but, uh, but you see in India itself, this finance capital actually tra are trying to destroy all these mountains, jungles, and also Adivasis like. Whereas, you may not support their ways, but these Maoists, <coughs> who are actually claims to be Marxist, Leninist, and uh, supporter of Mao Zedong thought or Maoism, they are actually fighting for the tribes, as you see in India, and they are not, they are against uh, destroying uh, this tribal uh, uh, society. So in that sense, also you see that uh, this is not a mechanical question that Marxists put economics first. It is not a moral question, but of course that is a thing that is used in their theory how society develops and what is the most basic things uh, that works. Okay, thank That's you. Right. I'll deal with that so far and just briefly, but thank you for this question because I also, I have a tremendous admiration for Marx and Engels and when I say they applied in some ways the theory of revolution to society, this is in, in m Marx and Engels' own terms, when they are tracing the development of society through certain stages, and Marx wanted to um, dedicate one volume of Capital to Darwin because of that. He had a great admiration for it. And Marx, especially in his later work, also had a tremendous understanding and sensitivity towards tribal societies. He was very, very well read, and you probably know his last book that he was working on when he died is known as the Ethnographic Notebooks. Um, and I think this sensitivity towards tribal cultures is something I miss in some of the in some of Marx's followers, if you like. And in taking the economy as primary, you know, Marx's analysis of capitalism is probably the best that has been done. But in Taking it as dogma, and especially in highlighting only the economic aspects of it, or highlighting them as, as you call it, the, in, the, the basic infrastructure, I think is a very grave mistake. And it's where, to me, there is often an, an unholy alliance between the Marxists and the um, mainstream in putting economics first, when economics should be, in my view, reformulated as something that has to serve society rather than dictating the the what's going to happen in, in terms of policy. That's and in terms of the Maoists I'm sure some of the leadership is very sincere in what they're believing and they have a lot of coherence when they are saying that they are supporting the Adivasis, but actually when they are opposing the MOUs with the mining companies, I would say they're doing it partly strategically. I would say you will never get an open critique of the mining industry from the Maoists. Why? Partly because financially it seems they depend on a lot of the mining companies for protection money or whatever you call it. And partly because, and this shows when they attack, as they, for example, attack the Nalco mine, 
They didn't try to close the mine down. They have never tried to close a mine or factory down. They are trying now to prevent, they say, the Raugat mines, but again, I would say this is largely strategic and in many ways is counterproductive because by supporting the Adivasi movement against the Raugat mines that Tata and Bilai still don't want, that has allowed the deployment of 4,000 security forces to the area that is there to try to ensure the mines go through. But above all, because I don't know whether the Maoists, in teaching about Mao, whether they mentioned the Great Leap Forward, that in 1958, when Mao wanted to overtake Britain and America and the Soviet Union in terms of steel production, and forced millions of peasants into um, steel production from agriculture, I think there's no doubt that he caused the world's worst famine. And some estimates put it at 30 million. I know Utsuk Patnaik and other scholars dispute that. But there's no question the numbers were absolutely huge. And that people who tried to tell Mao what was really going on, that the quotas manipulated, that thousands of people were dying of starvation, that um, certain abuses of power were going on, they themselves were killed before they could get to him. And I certainly see him as guilty of that. And in using that, his name then, Mao was trying to do then what China has since succeeded in doing. China is now the largest, world's largest producer of steel. And India is following in Mao's footsteps by becoming the world's fourth largest steel producer. So, the yes, the Maoists are using the Adivasis. I'm sure they are, many of them, sincere in that. But in a way, to me, the Maoist conflict is a mirror of the war on terror that America has been waging against Islamic, um, what they call terrorists. And the problem is, the more savagely that America attacks, the more civilians in Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan are joining the Islamic fundamentalists. And the more that the security forces, the more that Maoists attack the security forces, the more the security forces attack the tribals, and then that causes more recruitments for the Adivasi joining Maoists. And it's like a war without any end in sight because especially after Azad was killed, but there's not much um, peace process that is kind of almost conceivable at the moment. And this is, to me, mirroring the, the world outside, where you have this war and terror that... And what, is this, what, what this is compounding is that both sides are using weapons, but especially the state power is using the arms industry is there at the center of the world economy. The arms trade is the center of world corruption. And a lot of the world's wars, including the one in Chattisgarh and so on, is actually a war over resources. Ideologically, it's dressed up as a class war by the Maoists, just as ideologically it's dressed up by Al-Qaeda as a, a war for Islam, whatever. But these ideological issues are masking to me, what is really happening, which is a vicious war over resources being waged by the state. And the Maoist issue in these terms, I would say, is a red herring. I have just one question. That is, uh, while I agree with this point that each and every movement is against some sort of exploitation or another. And the model of development that is being adopted classically by capitalism and in India also is giving rise to more and more exploitation, displacing more and more people and not giving any solution finally. But the problem is that when we are talking about some fight against some form of exploitation, we must also be giving some alternative to that. Now, as you have told that up till now the best analysis of capitalism has been the socialist analysis or the Marx-Engels analysis. Now, if we want to make a critic of that, and if we want to develop upon that, mm -hmm. taking lessons from the tribal economics or whatever other forms of economics, 
if some solution is going to be provided today, right now, if, we, uh, the, if the government goes away right now, and some good government comes into the center right now, so it has to take some policies with respect to tribals, with respect to peasants, with respect to workers, and industry, etc. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest that such a policy, where should the fulcrum of such a policy be based on? Thank you so much. I mean, this is really such an important question, and it's very important you asked it. But what I would say essentially is two aspects. One is that in terms of the local grassroots economics, there needs to be a radical decentralization. That if you look at food production, I mean, what Gandhi said that food needs to be consumed where it's produced, I think was very literally true. And actually, in this country and in many other countries, there are very strong farmers' movements for going back to the land, for organic agriculture, replenishing the soil, and so on. But in terms of the wider economy, what is often forgotten in, by both sides, if you like, left and right, is during the 19th century, Henry George wrote this book called Progress and Poverty that was considered much more dangerous to the mainstream system than Marx. And in this book, Progress and Poverty, 1860s, what he's asking is, we've developed so far, so many forces of knowledge, why does poverty still exist? Of course, the Marxist answer we all know and understand, and it's very true. But it's much more in the details of the economic system. So one of the other textbooks that has been, as it were, airbrushed out of economic history is a thinker called Clifford Hugh Douglas. He wrote a book in 1920 called Economic Democracy. And, I mean, what's an amazing title for a book and a term of a system that became, it's very nearly swept the world, but it was, um, again, brushed aside eventually. But the essence of his system is called social credit. And the essence of it, it was put into practice in one state in Canada, the province of Alberta, which is the only state, either state government or state within a state, like the state governments of India, that has vastly reduced its national debt. And how does it do it, or what does his theory say? By taxing the banks and taxing financial institutions. So if this was done, if this could be done, of course, it could only be done, one has to stand up against the vast power of the IMF, World Bank, WTO, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, the whole lot of them. <coughs> but the essence, because the, the present system is so out of control, the deregulation, that um, if this kind of system could be put in place, then the whole derivative trading, speculation, could be the hedge funds, the tax havens and everything could be brought under control because this is the, the madness of the economic system that is present in place. It's something more and more people know about. Where I kind of take slight issue with the Marxists is they don't go enough into the institutions of capitalism. For example, the hedge funds, the tax havens, the four big accountancy firms in London, the credit rating agencies that rated Iceland banks as the best investment in the world until days before the 2008 crash started in Iceland, which was, by the way, around aluminium. So there are a, a large number of alternatives that are already established, but they've been, as it were, airbrushed out of our consciousness. And I think we have a lot of work to do to bring them back and to learn from the grassroots so many movements that are actually showing other ways are viable. From Ashoka's time uh, to Vedanta's time, it was Ashoka versus the tribals and Vedanta versus the tribals. How has their fight for sustainability changed over 2000 years? Okay, thank you very much. That is another really important question. That What I missed out in this particular talk was <coughs> the essence of British policy towards the tribals was alienating the tribal people from the forest during the mid-19th century, when they essentially said the forest belongs to the government. This was a complete outrage 